Hey, you found us. It's Bills by the Numbers. We're presented by FanDuel. We let the stats tell you where the Bills are at. Coming up, we've got our draft favorites at positions of need and a wild card pick. In these three things, we explore how many ways Brandon Bean can pivot with his first two picks. And we'll have our one burning question. Looks like we're on the clock. Good to have you with us. Bills Wall of Famer Steve Tasker, Bills Insider Chris Brown with you here on Bills by the Numbers. And we're a little less than a month away from the 2024 NFL Draft. And while the Bills will likely be making a signing or two between now and draft day, it's time to start piecing together what GM Brandon Bean could be looking at when he's on the clock at 28 and at 60 in round two. But before we get to that, we have our personal favorites for the Bills, with the likelihood that defensive tackle and receiver will remain two positions of intrigue for Buffalo, we're each going to pick our favorite prospect from each of those positions and a wild card player from any other position under the sun. Steve, give me your favorite receiver prospect in uh, this draft. I think the one that is actually going to be there, and there's going to be a handful of guys that are going to be there at 28, guys we've all heard about and that we have, you know, we've talked about. There's going to be guys. Like, uh, I don't think Brian Thomas Jr. will be there. Um, I don't know that uh, he's going to last that long. But let me just give you a quick list of the guys that I think have a chance to be there and the, and the one I like. The ones that are not going to be there, Marvin Harrison, of course. Malik Neighbors, of course. Roma Dunze, of course. I don't think, Marvin, uh, I don't think uh, Brian Thomas Jr. is going to be there. I think A.D. Mitchell's got a chance. Troy Franklin will be there. Lad McConkey will be there. But the guy I want is Xavier Leggett. Uh, the reason being this, certainly he's got some work to do on his route running and, and some of the, idiot, uh, the intricacies of the position, but his athleticism and his versatility give Joe Brady a chance to use him in a variety of ways, handing him the football off, using him in motions, using him as a guy that not, more, not a gadget guy like we saw Little Dirty be, you know, but more so a guy that's bigger. Uh, that really can take the ball up inside um, and also run routes and get open. So Xavier Leggett is the guy that I think has a chance to be a sleeper pick when you get down past uh, the Brian Thomas level of wide receiver room. Now, if any of those guys between the front top three, obviously, Marvin Harrison, Malik Neighbors, Adunze, Brian Thomas, if any of those guys are available, you snag them. But they're not going to be. And I think the first guy after that, if he's there, is for me, is Xavier Leggett. Yeah, I mean, I think they like him a lot um, just because of that versatility that you spoke of. We've seen comps to Debo Samuel, who also went to South Carolina. Um, I think he's one of those late risers based on the senior bowl that he had, went through the whole senior bowl week injured, um, played some quarterback in high school, not his whole high school career, but did have to play it just due to lack of – athletes on their football team and high school coaches put their best athletes at quarterback and uh, he had a productive year playing that in high school um, but he's built like a running back he's 6'1 right. 223 uh, so it does afford you the versatility uh, yeah he's one of my favorite receivers also but since you since you picked him I'll uh, go <laughs> in a different direction and look a little later in the draft and I'll go uh, with Ricky Pearsall the Florida kid right Six foot one ninety three ran a four four one forty precision route runner who gets consistent separation early in the down. I think they value that, and I think the fact that he can play outside or inside offers a different kind of versatility to that of Xavier Leggett. They like position flex at all their positions. The Bills do. So That's right. this is a guy that maybe a little bit later on, let's say they don't get the receiver in round one. I think Ricky Pearsall is a guy that could be there at pick 60, and he becomes a more viable option for them. Uh, strong hands to pluck the ball. You saw the catch that he made against UNC Charlotte on tape. Everybody's seen it. The one-handed, over-the-head, ridiculous, right. stupid grab. I don't know. People thought he lacked pull-away speed, but people are now questioning that after he ran a 4-4-1. 4-4-1 four, four, so, four, four, is fast. Yes, I think this is a guy that can get behind defenses, but I think his, his bread and butter – 
is being a consistent chain mover for an offense. And here's the other attractive quality. He also has punt return experience. Right. So if you have position flex where you can play inside and outside, that's attractive to the Bills. If you can add a special teams element, especially as a rookie, I think that too makes him an attractive I think too, you gotta remember, we've candidate. been on this wide receiver train throughout this offseason saying that's going to be the guy to, to replace Gabe Davis as a starter and take a lot of snaps. But even if you don't take one at 28, at 60, you're going to get a guy with some, with some tools and some upside. So um, – it's not I mean, the world's not going to come crashing down, and a guy like Ricky Pearsall is the type of guy who could step in, at, be there at, at pick sixty, and still contribute, yeah, off, significantly to the offense. Right, and because he can line up outside, if you have right. a guy locking down the slot role like a Khalil Shakir, and you also have Dalton Kincaid inside, you know, Pearsall is not lost and buried on the depth chart. He can still play a role for you somewhere else. And I think that's what the Bills are really looking for. Because right. if you have versatile options in your receiving core, not only do you have more options from a play-calling perspective for Joe Brady, but that player has more ways to get on the field early in their career as well. All right, let's move on to defensive tackle. Give me your favorite defensive tackle prospects. <clears throat> well, uh, this there's no question the Bills are going to have a chance to draft this guy. He will be on there at 28 and probably will be on there at 60 as well. But his name's Devere Levelston, uh, defensive tackle out of SMU. And one of the things he's got, he, he dips, he bends, he can get under there um, as a defensive end. Um, what makes him, what has been talked about is his ability to counter move and have an extra move at the end so we can continue to rush the passer, passer and give tackles a lot of problems. Um, he got better and better as his uh, college uh, career went on. Uh, had a really nice uh, year uh, in, um, in, as a sophomore in 2021. Uh, he's, a, he's a guy that's played a lot of football down inside, um, and I think he's got a chance to be really good. He's, he's going to be there for the Bills, maybe even in the 120s. Uh, but I think when you get into that, that level of the draft, this kind of guy's got some, got some measurables. He's got some, the traits that you're wanting. And he's also got some upside. So um, he's listed as a tackle, but I think he's going to be more of an end. Okay. Um, and he plays, has that position <clears throat> flexibility. If he's, he's got experience playing down inside. He's a little light, like 290 to be down inside. Yeah, you can play inside. But on third down, uh, certainly he could be in there. I was happy to see Brandon Bean sign, or at least agree to terms, with another nose tackle to rotate with da Daquan Jones and Austin Johnson in free agency. I think it also allows the Bills to take more of a penetrating style defensive tackle in the draft, of which there appear to be more of than the run pluggers. So I'm impressed with Ruke Ororo uh, from Clemson. Yeah, say that five times right. fast. 6'4", 294, power player, loose athlete with bend and explosive burst, often knifes between linemen to gain penetration in just two steps. Like he is on them in a hurry, and he's through a crack, and he's in on the quarterback. The thing about him that's impressive is he's 6'4", but he plays with really low leverage. It keeps offensive linemen from getting hands to his chest. And like I said, he relies on um, a burst and powerful hands to either blow by the offensive lineman or jolt them off the line of scrimmage. He was so successful at Clemson, they didn't really have to use a lot of different pass rush techniques at all right. besides stack and shed, uh, which he does in a flash. Really fast, powerful hands, violent tackler, consistent, 24 tackles for loss over his three years, Eight per year. They were equally balanced eight per year. Eleven and a half sacks. Fifth year senior. I think he has a chance to be there late in round two. Just an impressive player on tape, and I think there's some ceiling to reach there. I just like his natural tools, so he's a moldable piece of clay. So right. that's a guy, Ruke Ororo. Um, okay, now the fun part, Steve. Your wild card prospect that you like at any other position than receiver well, or I'll defensive tackle. I'll say this. I, I did have this. I've got this guy on, on my board, but I like Brownie's wild card better than mine. But um, because, Brownie, and because Brownie turned me on to the, his wild card guy, I did felt I couldn't take it. So yeah. I think the Bills are going to have a shot at the best safety on the board, Tyler Newbin out of Minnesota. Um, an anticipatory player, 
does everything well. This is exactly the kind of safety you want. And with what has happened with the Bills in this offseason, uh, you bring him in here and let him in on the field with Mike Edwards, those two guys may uh, be able to, to elevate the secondary a great deal. I think Tyler Newbin is a guy that will actually uh, get drafted in the f- late first, early second round, right where the Bills picking at 28. And if all those wide receiver options are there and if the Bills like where they're at uh, because of the uh, Curtis Samuel signing, I think Tyler Newbin could be an option for them and would be plugged in right away as a starter. So I'm, I like him. He's the best guy in that position in this draft, mm-hmm. and it's a position that you know over the last handful of years, Bills fans and the Bills, Bills at front office and the coaching staff have proven how important those spot this spot is, even though it's not the sexy money spot. So I think Tyler Newbin has a chance to be on the Bills board at 28. Yeah, 13 career interceptions at Minnesota set a school record. Uh, my wild card prospect is the Texas A&M linebacker, Edgerin Cooper. I haven't seen everybody at every position yet in terms of just getting ready for the draft, but his tape is my favorite, and it's not close. <laughs> just an eye-popping performer who plays without fear or hesitation. He believes he's going to dominate, and he often does. Long-levered, physical linebacker, brings power behind his pads, violent tackler, strong hands to wrap up, buries ball carriers, reads the play, comes downhill in a hurry, Closes gaps in the run front, blows up screens, plays with an attitude and an edge, was used as a spy on SEC quarterbacks like Jalen Milrow from Alabama, Jaden Daniels from LSU, effectively kept them under wraps. Long arms makes him an effective pass rusher, and we've seen the Bills use their linebackers as a blitz trigger, whether it's Milano. Uh, um, They used Bernard when Milano went out with injury. Uh, He can do that. They're not exactly the same, but this guy reminds me of the guy in Dallas and and I've Micah I should, Parsons? Mike Micah Parsons. They don't play the exact same position, but that's the kind of athlete he is. Yeah, he plays more inside off the ball. He Parsons is, was outside. He is that kind of athlete. Faster than most of the guys around him. Long, aggressive, hard to block. Per, I mean, relentless pursuit. I mean, this yeah, I'm Edgerin Cooper is a guy that a lot of people are going to hear a lot about, no matter who drafts him. So if he's there for the Bills, yeah, I'm, I'm all about him. Eight sacks, 17 tackles for loss last year as an inside linebacker. Uh, also, <laughs> you're going to like this, covers kicks and punts on special teams. Let's go! I, just, I, I think he's a high second-round pick. I think he's probably one of the first three names off the board on day two. Uh, I don't think he lasts to number 60 for Buffalo. Is he consideration for the Bills at 28? Yeah. We'll have to wait and see. That's I, the, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't gravitate to the position need that they have necessarily. Um, but we can talk about that. And plus the Bills have got a bunch of young guys they love too. Um, well, you have Bernard. Bernard and Milano. And, you know, it's, they're just – it's not a spot where you'd think the Bills would go to. But, man, oh, man, that guy's a really enticing film. Um, and well, that's where you talk about value. And, so at 28, and I'll say this: if the value's gone at receiver. It's not good at defensive tackle. They don't like an edge rusher there. If there's a doubt about Milano's ability to come back and be ready for the start of the season, you could do a lot worse. You than could Edger do a lot. Cooper. You could do a lot worse. You could do a lot worse. Uh, we begin these three things with our first thing. As we know, more often than not, Brandon Bean has addressed a perceived positional need in round one, whether it was trading up for Josh Allen or Tremaine Edmonds, Ed Oliver, Greg Rousseau, Kyrie Elam, or Dalton Kincaid. He's addressed a positional need with a prospect that has elite physical traits. Which way do we believe he leans positionally in round one, Steve? I think he's, uh, well, I think he's going to take a wide out. I just don't think there's any way around it. I think there's too many good guys. Yeah, it's it's so deep at the top, right? And, I mean, knowing they have a need for a number one wideout to move into that role by 2025, perhaps even sooner, it's got to be acquired via cheap labor, yeah. which is the draft. Yeah. So I, I kind of see him taking a premier receiver prospect early, too. And I and it's not out of the question either with the way this draft has fallen, the fact that they don't have a you know third rounder, at least until late, um, that that does complicate things. Yeah, it makes things tough, and it, we're not, it's not out of the question that they might jump up and get one if at like four or five spots. And they're not going up t- 
15 spots, I don't think. But they might go up. Oh, you're saying five. if there's a run on receivers early. Yeah. If Brian, they, like if Brian Thomas is off the board 18 to the Bengals, you're right. probably going to have to move. That's correct. But I don't know that he will be. Um, this is that's you got kind of have to sit tight and wait. Yeah, you do. And but you're talking to a lot of people saying, "Hey, if you wanted to move out, what would you need?" There? Yeah, this is like, all in place before the draft starts. But um, but you're talking about jumping up, you know, into the 23, 22, 23, 24 in Philly, Minnesota, Dallas, um, Minnesota. It's probably not going to be there because they're going to use those picks to jump up and get a quarterback, right? So whoever is – Minnesota is at 11 and 23. And, 23. and everybody thinks they're going to jump up and get, you know, one of the top five spots from Arizona, L.A., or maybe even New England. Or I don't think anybody else is going to move out, but we'll see. If they do that, whoever they trade with is going to get more picks, and you might be able to kind of finagle up into that spot with – you know, with Arizona, who might get more picks that way. Uh, or they may grab Denver, uh, although Denver's in the same kind of boat. They don't have the ammo to move up. Right. Well, they might be willing to slide back then. That's right. Maybe so, more than once. But you're talking about you're talking about teams in the mid-20s, Pittsburgh, Miami, Philly, Minnesota, Dallas, uh, Green Bay. You know, that's only four spots, three spots up from 28 to 25. That could happen. But you got to get a willing partner to do it. Second thing, we heard Brandon Bean at the league meetings talk about how they felt they got a raw deal, not getting a third-round compensatory pick. They appealed to the league and were denied. So how do you think it might impact Bean's approach knowing after pick 60, they don't pick until day two? Um, or sorry, they don't pick until day three. Day three. If they stay with the picks they've got. Yeah. How does that impact not having a three? How do you think that impacts his approach? I think he's getting players he knows can play in those first on 28 and 60. They're not going to Right take, away you're talking about? Right away. I think they're going to they're going to get guys at positions they need who they think have the physical ability to step in and plug in and play. Mm. They're not I don't think there's going to be any project at 28. There's going to be a project at 60. They're going to pick guys who they have penciled in already. Because uh, that, that's where we're at. Well, we're, right. We're, they have they to fill the to. roster with people they who can fill play the roster. immediately. And so those much two like guys did, at the much top. Much like they did last year. Right. With all the Kincaid picks they have, and Torrance. with the nine picks they have left the rest of the way at this point, they might be able to take, okay, we can wait on this guy or we can wait on that guy. But those top two picks are on the field. And while I agree with that, I agree with all of that, what you just said, I think the limited draft capital early in their lot of picks I think will prompt Bean to make a move into the bottom of round three. I don't think, I don't think he trades up in round one. I don't think he trades up in round two. I think he sits tight because he knows he doesn't have the capital to right. make a significant move. Right. Um, and so I see him doing a day three trade into day two. So I kind of see them packaging either a four and a five or a four and two sixes and moving into the bottom of round three, or who knows, maybe if you really like somebody, maybe even in the top half of round three. Um, he is not a GM that sits idly by and watches the draft go by him. I, right. I think after pick 60, he's going to, it's going to kill him. I think he's going to have to move into round three well, somewhere. So I think that's his move up. I don't think it's in round one. I don't think it's in round two. I think he moves up in round three somewhere to get that third prospect that he believes can play right away. And there are positions that offer that kind of depth, receiver being one. Um, I think there are some there, – there might be one other position where you find that, maybe a defensive tackle who can play a rotational role. So I could see him moving up – there. I think his move up the board goes from round four to round three, because uh, I just don't think they have enough capital on the top half of their cachet of picks that affords that kind of move. Right. And it, it, what, what you're looking at is if you're talking about um, moving up, you're, you're going to have to bundle some picks, obviously. And when you do that, it I mean, comes they have up. 128, 133, 
144, 160, 163. 144, 160, 163. That is in the neighborhood oh, of... Oh, you trade all those? Yeah, if you trade three... Two fives and five, a six. Two fives. No, they're all on the fifth. Well, they only have two in the fifth. This is uh, 144. Well, hold on. This Well, this, is, this may not be accurate then. Yeah, it doesn't count compensatories, I think. Right. Right. Anyway, that... But you're talking about moving up a hundred, you know, to hundred points. Eh, you you maybe you'll be in to get into the last of the third. Yeah, I think the bottom last half of the, of the third. third is where he's going to try to maneuver. <clears throat> Which to is get there. in numbers wise, is somewhere between eighty five and hundred. Yeah, and that's where you're you're going to try and get to. Now you could take, you know, one thirty three, and one sixty. You still wouldn't get up there. That'd be fifty seven. And that you got to get all the way. Well, what about one one twenty eight and one sixty? Is that enough? One twenty eight. That's forty four and forty four, and that'd be. It's close. Seventy one. No. Not good enough. No, it's not. Well, maybe good you got to give that your two That just moves fours. you up. That moves you up only to, uh, like one ten. Okay. You know. I I kind of see that kind of move. Um, day three into bottom of day two. I don't think he's going to be able to wait that long. And if there's a chance to get somebody that they feel can help them right away late on day two, I think right. it's, I think it's worth moving. And I could they, see him doing. That. He's and I I don't know. I, we know nothing about this, but there's always a chance they throw in one of these late round picks or mid round picks and a player. That's that's a possibility, but I have no idea who that player would be, and we because that's what we don't know. We don't well, know the Bills' evaluations of their own guys, so that's where you kind of have to go. I don't know. Right, and I, I think they're trying to fill out a roster, so I don't know if a player becomes part of a trade because now you're subtracting from a roster you're trying to add to because you don't have enough yeah, bodies. Yeah, that's right. But if you do have a, a position of of strength, like if you do take a guy like Edger and Cooper. All of a sudden, Matt Milano or or uh, the young pl- uh, Dorian Williams or somebody like that, uh, Balen Specter, one of those players that is kind of stuck in line waiting to play. Yeah. Uh, depending on what another team saying. thinks. Okay. Uh, third thing, what position could you see getting addressed earlier than some might be thinking in light of their free agent activity thus far in the draft? What position could you see them maybe addressing sooner than people expect? Corner. Corner. Okay. Yeah. Ennis Rakestraw Jr. I, well, well uh, that would I, have to be a first-round pick if they're doing that. Right. He's good. Because he's going to be bottom of round one but probably. But that's, uh, that's a sneaky pick. Okay, corner. All corner right. maybe. I mean, Dane Jackson is in Carolina. Mm-hmm. Tredavious White's going to the Rams after he got released. So basically you what you Elam. have – Benford, Douglas, Rasul. Everybody behind that is. I mean, even Saran Neal's not here anymore. And question marks. And Taron. Well, Taron, yeah, Taron's his own entity. Right. Right. He's in his. He's a class by himself, and they just extended him. He ain't going anywhere, and they and they're not going to draft anybody to replace him either. Yeah, I like that. Corner's a sneaky need. I think the other one is linebacker. You know, they've lost Tyler Matikavich, special teamer. Tyrell right. Dotson's in Seattle. A.J. Klein's going back into retirement. Right. Matt Milano's lengthy recovery, which is expected to stretch into training camp, also raises at least the consideration of a contingency plan. Right. So I think linebacker could be a viable option here early on day three, if not sooner, if the value disappears at some of the more pressing positions. Time for the numbers game. And the uh, challenge for Steve is draft pick volume history. And I've got to pull this up on my computer. So just give me a quick second here as we get set to play the numbers game. And I figured this was, you know, apropos, go with draft pick history here. So let me pull up question number one. And forgive me, I've got too many folders in my hard drive here, but let me get to it. (laughs) Got it now. Question number one, Steve. In how many McDermott-era drafts have the Bills used more than seven picks? So we're counting the 2017 draft along with everything after that. How many have they used more than seven picks, I'll do you say, think? I'll just say How two. Times? Two. It's actually four times. Oh, really? The 2018 draft. Quick buzzer. The 2019 draft. 
the 2021 draft and the 2022 draft, they used seven at least or at least uh, eight picks or more. Wow. Okay. Okay. What is the highest number of picks the Bills have used in a McDermott Bean draft? So you know there's four of them in which they used more than seven. Yeah, I'm going to say ten. The answer is only eight. (sighs) Ah! Okay. So since you asked that very question, Steve, you transitioned us nicely to question number three, which is when was the last time the Bills made use of ten picks or more in an NFL draft class? When's the last time they used 10 picks or more? You know it did not happen in McBean era in the McBean draft. You're going with 2015. Yeah. That is that is no. Golly, that I will tell you pleasure. it's it's even further back. Is it? Yeah. I have no Take a idea. second oh shot at it. Gosh, two, you know, I, 2003. Uh, not that far back. Somewhere in between 2015 and I'm totally and guessing. I'm like picking names out of yeah, we Well, we figured you would. Um, uh, give me a give me a player in one of those drafts in this draft. Uh, Can you remember? Well, I I, it kind of that transitions to question four. Oh, all right. So I'm, I'm kind of uh, hesitant to I'm do gonna so. I'm going to say 2012. That would be 2008 is the draft we're oh. looking for. I'm, a, I'm out here in the wilderness. So I'm now guessing. question four, Steve. Can you name a player from the Bills 2008 draft class? One player. So there were, you know there were ten. Uh, I believe the Bills picked 12th that year. Um, and the first round pick came out of Troy University. Second round pick came out of Indiana. Dude. Third round pick out of Virginia. Who are these guys? Uh, I can't remember the college of the fourth round pick. I want to say Akron, but I'm not sure if that's true. And one of their other fourth round picks came out of Kansas. He was a tight end. One of the few picks out of Kansas. Yeah, they, <clears throat> those they are. have basketball players. Let's say first round pick out of Troy University, and he was a corner. Two thousand eight draft. Hold on. Also a return man. Leotis. Leotis McKelvin, my man. Uh, here. <laughs> Thanks for giving me the, a couple of clues. Here is uh, the wow. rundown of the rest of the draft class in 2008. Okay. Mm-hmm. Leotis McKelvin, James Hardy, receiver out of Indiana, Christian Ellis, linebacker slash pass rusher out of Virginia, Reggie Corner, who played cornerback, Derek Fine was the tight end we were looking for out of Derek Kansas. Derek Fine. Ooh. Alvin Bowen. Linebacker out of Iowa State. Xavier Oman, a running back from nowhere. Demetrius, Demetrius Bell, who then changed his name to Demetrius, out of 1AA Northwestern State. Stevie Johnson Stevie. in the seventh round pick yeah. out of Kentucky. And with their final pick in round seven, a cornerback out of Pitt, Kennard Cox. Wow. Those, I'm just going to say, Steve, those were not the days. Those were not well. For those draft were, prowess. Listen, they that was the heart of the drought. I mean, that's right in the middle. Yeah, you're right, dead nut center. Yes. Oh, a hundred percent accurate. With we your, had no uh, idea. That was after the Marshawn Lynch, Paul. We had no idea what good Edwards drafting draft. was. Oh my gosh, we had no clue. No idea. Oh, that was the year before Aaron Maben. And you wonder why the oh Bills gosh. drift ar- drift along in the wilderness during that time. You just talked about the 2007 draft. Marshawn Lynch has gone after three years, and Paul Puzlozny has gone after four. Right. Those are your top two draft choices, yep. and they're no longer on the roster. How Dante, are you supposed to Dante Whitner the left draft? the year before. McCargo, McCargo was Yeah, there's another swing nothing. and a miss on top two picks Cole there. Williams, uh, Ashton Yabuti, and then you got Kyle Williams. As You know, you, you go through these drafts, and oh, yeah. usually there's like one guy. There's a diamond in the rough. Yeah, there's the one guy. The draft class, it's McKelvin and Stevie. That's it. Yeah. It's it's terrible. Yeah, it was, it's, it's hard to get it right. And I... That's why it's amazing that some of these teams, well, like the Chiefs and the Bills, where they keep picking these guys and they keep getting contributors. You know, Kincaid, Shakir, Osiris Torrance, Osiris Torrance. even Dorian know. Williams looks like he's going to be a nice Dorian player. Dorian Shepard, Bernard, 
all these guys, they're they're hitting on these guys, which is really difficult to do. And if you want to know why you're at the top of the draft, certainly jo- picking Josh and having him spread his wings the way he has is a huge factor in it. But all the supporting cast has been has made a big difference. Milano, you know, and then you oh, it's just amazing. Yeah. Taron Johnson. There's a lot of them. Uh, Bills fans, get in on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Just download the app today to play any way you want. Plus, with live betting, you'll get updated odds on games that have already started. Best of all, you get paid your winnings fast. Make every moment more with FanDuel, official sports book partner of the Buffalo Bills. We turn now to our one burning question. How many picks will the Bills ultimately use to pick players in the 2024 NFL Draft, Steve. They have 11 right now. You just heard the history. They haven't used more than 10 picks since 2008. They've got 11. How many do you think they actually use to select players in this year's draft? Well, it would be easy to say they pick all 11. I don't think they will. I think they'll take either um, the, the over under for they me they need numbers let's the, not oh, forget they got to fill this man, roster out the over under for me is eight and a half mm. i think they'll they'll trade a couple of picks away i'm going to say nine okay. i think they'll make he'll make because of the roster situation right now i think they'll probably use nine of the picks trade two away and move up a couple of spots for a guy i think your over under is bang on because i was going to say eight so eight yeah. and a half is a great line to put down uh but i think i think eight because I think he's going to have to part with some draft capital to move up. As I said earlier, I think they're going to make a move back into round yeah. three late on day I don't two. Think they're, I don't think they're moving off. I don't think there's a, there's a chance they don't move off 28 or 60. I think he's got to sit tight up there. Right. And I think, sit I think the movement is going to come down in the bottom of the draft, the bottom of the draft where we've been talking about back into the, you know, the one, 128, 133. 144, 160s, all of that. I mean, that's that's where they're going to be moving around. And it'll be, you know, they'll move up five or ten spots to get a guy. As we have tried to assess how Brandon will approach his first two picks, knowing there's a long wait after that, most likely, our closing figure deals with how the Bills' first two picks have unfolded in each of the six drafts Brandon Bean has overseen. In four of the six drafts, Bean has split his first two picks with one for offense, one for defense. The only times he did not last year with Dalton Kincaid and Osiris Torrance, both for offense, and in 2021 when Greg Russo and Boogie Basham made it two for the defense with the first two selections. Every other draft he has overseen has gone one for offense, one for defense. We'll see if majority rules in 2024. That'll do it for this edition. Be sure to subscribe on your podcast platform of choice so you know when the next episode drops because when you need to know about the Bills, you need to check Bills by the Numbers. For Steve Tasker, I'm Chris Brown. Thanks for listening. We'll catch you next time, everybody. 